Okay, let's continue with chapter three. So now that we talked about levers, let's just do a brief recap. So the torque and length of lever arms. So a human leverage system is built for speed and range of motion, unfortunately at the expense of force. So short force arms and long resistance arms require great muscular strength to produce movement. Example, biceps and triceps attachments, biceps forearm is one to two inches and the biceps forearm is less than one inch. Okay, so short force arms and long resistance arms require great muscle strength. So when you have a short force arm, such as the biceps and triceps, it requires greater muscle strength. So you really have to work hard to grow your biceps and your triceps. Now, in sports, human leverage for sports skills requires several levers. So throwing a ball involves levers at the shoulder, elbow, and wrist joints. The longer the lever, the more effective it is in imparting velocity. So a tennis player can hit a tennis ball harder with a straight arm drive than with a bent elbow because the lever, including the racket, is longer and moves faster. That's why technique is so important. You want this elbow to be straight the racket to be straight if you want to deliver great power and force. This is why people emphasize technique, right? So if there's a flaw in your technique here, then you're not as efficient. So now you understand why coaches will emphasize technique, technique, technique. If he's side bent, if his elbow is bent, then he's not going to have as much power than if he's a straight lever arm right here. Now, think about in sports such as baseball and golf. So goes back to um, baseball here. Long levers produce more linear force and thus better performance in some sports such as baseball, hockey, golf, field hockey, and so on. You're increasing the lever arm, but look at his elbow. Straight, bam, straight, straight as an arrow, straight as an arrow, boom. So he's just more efficient. You've seen people that have poor golf uh, uh, game. Well, they're just side bent here. They're not straight. Same thing with, look at the, look at this. Psh, this guy is like just perfect technique, right? Boom, boom, straight. So the look how straight that is. He's just increasing his lever arm just like that. Okay. Now, if we want quickness, so that's the difference between a hitter and a catcher. For quickness, it's desirable to have a short lever arm. Okay, so you don't see uh, the catchers that are real long and lanky, right? Because we want them to be fast. So a baseball catcher attempting to throw a runner out at second does not have to throw the ball so that it travels as fast as when it, the pitcher is attempting to throw a strike. So we want him to get it out of his hand quickly. Boom. Okay, so we don't have to worry about fast. We want it to be quick here. So baseball catcher attempting to throw a runner out at base does not have to throw the ball so that it travels as fast as when the pitcher is attempting to throw a strike. So pitchers may want to have to throw it at 90 to 100 miles per hour, but the catcher doesn't have to uh, throw it at 90 to 100 miles an hour. He just needs to be accurate. Okay, so if he can get the ball and get it out of his hand, boom, it's good. Okay. So for quickness, it's desirable to have a short lever arm. Okay, so it's get out, bam, quick. Catchers need to be quick. Pitchers need to be fast. So now we talk about wheels and axles, used primarily to enhance range of motion and speed of movement in the musculoskeletal system. Function essentially as a form of a first class lever. When either the wheel or the axle turns, the other must turn as well both complete one turn at the same time. So essentially it's a type of first class lever, wheels and axles. So center of wheel and the axle both correspond to the fulcrum. Okay, both the radius of the wheel and the radius of the axle correspond to the force. If the wheel radius is greater than the radius of the axle, then due to the long force arm, the wheel has a mechanical advantage over the axle. A relatively small force may be applied to the wheel to move a relatively greater resistance applied to the axle. If the radius of the wheel is five times the radius of the axle, then the wheel has a five to one mechanical advantage over the axle. Okay, so a mechanical advantage here would, of a wheel and axle can be calculated by considering the radius of the wheel over the axle.
So here's the axle, here's the radius. So if the application force is reversed and, the, and applied to the axle, then the mechanical advantage results from the wheels turning a greater distance at a greater speed. So if the radius of the wheel is five times the radius of the axle, the outside of the wheel will turn at a speed five times that of axle. So the distance that the outside of the wheel turns will be five times that of the outside of the axle. Like, what does this all mean, Patel? Come on. Okay, the mechanical advantage for this example can be calculated by considering the radius of the wheel over the axle. So, let's give you an example. Muscles apply force to the axle to result in greater range of motion and speed, which can be seen in the upper extremity in the case of internal rotators attaching to the humerus. So the humerus acts as the axle. The hand and wrist are located at the outside of the wheel when the elbow is flexed approximately 90 degrees. With minimal humerus rotation, the hand and the wrist travel a great distance, right? You can barely move your humerus and you can move the hand and wrist a great distance. Using the wheel and axle allows us to significantly increase the speed at which we could throw objects. So from a baseball standpoint, you only have to move your humeral rotation slightly to get huge hand and wrist movement. But imagine if you really move your humerus, then you're going to get a lot more distance and you're going to get a lot more speed out of that. That's why pitchers can throw 100 miles an hour because the rotation at the humerus allows for great hand and wrist travel. Okay, so all pulleys, levers, wheels, and axles. Okay, so let me let me show you an example. All right, so here's some examples of wheels and axles. Here's the throwing a football, throwing a baseball. So you're relatively moving a small amount here to get a huge amount of rotation here. Uh, cars work the same way. Here's the force. Here's the axle. Doorknobs work the same way. Here's the axis. There's the rotation of the wheel. And of course, Ferris wheels work the same way. Here's the radius. Here's the axis. And there's the wheel. All right. So you understand all this. But from a sports performance, uh, internal external rotation is a perfect example of wheels and axles. Okay, so the humerus and form acting like a wheel and axle as a player throws a football pass. Now we go on to pulleys. And pulleys uh, will definitely give us a mechanical advantage. Single pulleys function to change the effective direction of the force of the application. So mechanical advantage is equal to 1. So here's 1. Here's 50 kilograms of weight and here's I have to pull 50 kilograms so that's really two but if I put two pulleys here even though there's 50 kilograms I only have to pull 25 so I gave you that monkey and the elephant example if the elephant weighs 500 pounds and he had five pulleys he only had to pull 100 pounds to really move that elephant right because each pulley gives him a mechanical advantage so pulleys may be combined to form compound pulleys to increase the mechanical advantage. Each additional rope increases the mechanical advantage by one. So example, the lateral malleolus acting as a pulley around which the tendon of the peroneus longus runs. As the peroneus longus contracts, it pulls towards its belly toward the knee. Using the lateral malleolus as a pulley, the force is transmitted to the plantar aspect of the foot, resulting in downward and outward movement of the foot. So there's an example of a pulley in the body. Now, balance, ability to control equilibrium, either static or dynamic. Equilibrium is st state of zero acceleration, where there is no change in the speed of direction of the body, static or dynamic, and static equilibrium body is at rest or completely motionless. So know the difference between balance, equilibrium, and static equilibrium. So balance is the ability to control equilibrium, either static or dynamic. Equilibrium is the state of zero acceleration where there is no change in speed or direction. And static equilibrium, body is at rest or completely motionless. Dynamic equilibrium, which is sports, 
all together is how do you how efficient are you at controlling dynamic equilibrium is all applied inertial forces acting on the body are in balance resulting in movement with unchanging speed or direction to control equilibrium and achieve balance stability needs to be maximized stability is the resistance to change in the body's acceleration disturbance of the body's equilibrium so the more efficient you are then the better athlete you're going to be stability is enhanced by turning the body's center of gravity and appropriate changing it center of gravity means the point at which all the body's mass and weight are equally balanced or equally distributed in all directions and balance important in resting and moving bodies generally of course balance is desired but some circumstances exist where movement is improved when the body tends to be unbalanced so some uncertainty exists where movement is improved when the body tends to be unbalanced so let's take a look at some examples here general factors applicable to enhancing equilibrium maximizing stability and achieving balance so let's look at a b c d and e a person has balance when the center of gravity falls within the base of support. So here's the base of support, and here's my center of gravity. Here's my base of support, here's my center of gravity. Here's my base of support, here's my center of gravity. Base of support, center of gravity. Base of support here, center of gravity. So when you're doing a squat, you want to make sure that your, your center of gravity is in between your base of support. If you're too far forward, too far back, and you're not, you're not going to be very efficient. So that's where the squat really comes in and where you need to be very efficient and conscious of where your center of gravity is with your base of support. So in general, a person has balance in direct proportion to the size of the base. The larger the base of support, the more balance. Think about sumo wrestlers. They increase their base of support, they have more balance. A person has balance depending on the weight or mass. The greater the weight, the more the balance. All right? Offensive linemen. They're not little skinny twigs like me. I would not make a good offensive lineman. We need great weight and we need balance. A person has balance depending on the height of the center. The lower the center of gravity, the more balance. So a short, big uh, uh, offensive lineman, right? You can't have a seven foot six, uh, uh, 165 pound offensive lineman. We need someone that's 300 pounds, six foot, maybe under, and stocky. That's going to increase my balance. And there, that offensive line is not getting to the quarterback. Okay. Person has balance depending on where the center of gravity is in relation to the base of support. Balance is less if the center of gravity is near the edge of the base. When anticipating oncoming force, stability may be improved by placing the center of gravity near the side of the base of support expected to receive the force. All right, so you might shift your balance depending on where you think you're going to receive the force here. So let me show you two examples and tell me who has better balance and better stability. All right, so you look at Manu Bull, Charles Barkley. This guy's tall, obviously. Charles is shorter relatively, but he's actually probably more balanced and is more stable. He knock, all he has to do is push bull, Manu Bull and he's going to be right on his butt here. And if you look at sumo wrestlers, what do they do? They get in that sumo squat and boom, they're stable right here. He's ready. Boom. Okay. So there's no way this guy's going to move him. Balance, stability. In anticipation of oncoming force, stability may be increased by enlarging the size of the base of support in the direction of the anticipated force. Equilibrium may be enhanced by increasing the friction between the body and the surface it contacts. And rotation about an axis aids balance. A moving bike is easier to balance than a stationary bike. Okay. So rotation about an axis also aids balance. So a moving bike is easier to balance than a stationary bike. So these are easy quiz questions that you shouldn't miss. Uh, kinesthetic physiological functions contribute to balance. The semicircular canals of the inner ear, vision, touch, or pressure in a kinesthetic sense all provide balance information to the performer. And balance and its components of equilibrium and stability are essential in all movements and are all affected by the constant force of gravity as well as inertia. 
in walking a person throws the body in and out of balance with each step so walking is actually you just controlled falling in rapid running movements where moving inertia is high the center of gravity has to be lower to maintain balance when stooping or changing directions in jumping activities the center of gravity needs to be raised as high as possible okay so just little tricks of the trade here uh, obviously if you run straight uh, versus if you're kind of head down and you're really kind of uh, in that running style or running form you're going to be much more rapid okay all right good job